Jewish professors at City University of New York are suing the Professional Staff Congress Union in power at the university, challenging the New York state law that PSC union officials use to force the professors under the control of a union they find anti-Semitic and anti-Israel. Well, here to discuss the civil rights lawsuit further is Mark Mix, the president of the National Right to Work Foundation and with the Foundation and the Fairness Center representing the plaintiffs. Thank you for joining us. Stephanie, good to be with you and thanks for paying attention to these important cases like this. It's really uh, an amazing story when you have to unpack it and see the power of the unions over these professors. And there's a lot to unpack here, but briefly tell us more about the backstory behind this lawsuit. Yeah, we're helping to represent six professors at the City University of New York, CUNY as they call it. And these professors are required to accept this professional staff congress as their monopoly representative in the workplace. Meaning this, this union gets to represent them, speak for them, and basically uh, do everything that affects the working conditions in the, at their place of, of employment. And frankly, this radical union is opposed to the basically the identity, the nationality, the religion of these professors and have articulated this view, this anti-Israel view, as a statement by this union that represents these Jewish professors. Uh, five of them are Jewish, one of them is not. But they bring these charges because it, this union has this power granted by state law to be the exclusive monopoly voice in the workplace. These workers never asked for, never wanted the union, but yet they're forced to accept them and associate with them despite these radical opinions they have against the identity, the culture, the nationality, and the religion of these professors. And we, this is one of thousands and thousands and thousands of cases, Stephanie, where this private organization, this union, has injected themselves between the employees and those that, you know, their, their employers, if you will, and, and get to speak for them. These employees, one of the professors has already got the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to issue a letter saying he's been discriminated against, he's been intimidated, and yet they still have to accept this union as their bargaining agent. So what we're trying to do is attack this, this First Amendment violation of forced association by showing dramatically, in this case, the power that unions have over these professors. I want to get to that letter that you mentioned in just a moment, but you even wrote an op-ed about, about the case and how it challenges the concept of public sector union monopoly bargaining. You mentioned how these professors require security detail when on campus and are continuously harassed. Why haven't CUNY officials stepped in to offer their support or condemn these sort of attacks or have they and we just haven't heard about it? Well, because the union has so much power under the state law, the Taylor law, and in many states across the country, and in the private sector as well. Union officials have been granted this power way back in the 1930s and under the Roosevelt administration for private sector employees. And in fact, Stephanie, what's interesting about this is when Roosevelt was asked about why wouldn't we do this for government employees, he says, well, that's unthinkable. You, it's not the same in the, as in the private sector where you have competition and competing interests in the workplace. In the public sector, you have this monopoly union, this private organization that gets to inject themselves, you know, most kind of uh, identifiably between taxpayers and elected officials, but here between professors and, and the university itself. You know, the university is kind of kowtowed by this union. They have to negotiate with them. They have to get along with them. And we've seen in Chicago and Los Angeles and other places where, you know, teachers and union officials demand that teachers just walk out on the job. So this power they have is unique and it's a special privilege. And so, you know, the, the university itself is those folks may be kind of inclined to support what this so-called professional staff Congress wants to do. But they don't have the power to fight back because everything has to be negotiated. And so the union is in a unique, powerful position, and that's one of those places where they really, really want to be. And it basically says they're the single sole monopoly voice in this workplace on behalf of these professors. And going back to that letter that you mentioned earlier, one of the professors, Jeffrey Lacks, already, as you mentioned, won a letter of determination from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which found that Cooney and PSC leaders discriminated against him retaliated against him and subjected him to a hostile work environment on the basis of religion. Yet PSC officials remain his representative because of New York law. With your lawsuit, what is the end goal if PSC officials are, still have to represent these professors? Yeah, Stephanie, the goal of the case is two parts. One is, is this abuse of the forced association that comes with the law. We want to strike that down as a violation of the First Amendment. It was about three years ago we won a case in the U.S. Supreme Court called Janus v. Asme, 
that basically protects government employees from being forced to pay union dues or fees uh, as a condition of working for their government. And what happened there is the court got to the First Amendment, the free speech part of the First Amendment. There's a second part of that, the speech part, because the money that they were forced to pay was being used for political purposes. And so Justice Alito and four other justices in the majority said, look, this is all political speech, so you can't force it, can't compel it under the free speech First Amendment protections. The second part of that is the forced association. You know, they're not a force to pay for this speech, this forced speech, but they're still a force to associate. And we believe the right to associate that exists also presupposes logically the right not to associate. But yet state law in New York and several other states says you must associate as a condition of you working. You must allow this private organization to speak for you. You must allow this private organization to negotiate for you. You must accept what this private organization gets and work under the conditions that they impose on you. So the freedom of association is what we're after here. And we want the unions to be able to say, look, look, we'll represent you, but you must be, you know, you must accept our representation voluntarily, not through coercion and force. That's the big piece of this case. And this would also apply for uh, like in other different fields, because we hear of people saying that they don't want to join a certain union because of some of the proposals that they endorse. But I want to go back to some of this, uh, that op-ed that you wrote. But speaking of op-eds, uh, CUNY professor a Abraham Goldstein, who's one of the plaintiffs of the case, detailed his personal experience with the Professional Staff Congress Union. He also mentioned that 2018 Supreme Court ruling. What, what do you want people to know about this case and uh, how it's going to possibly affect the outcome of this lawsuit. Yes, yeah, Stephanie. Well, you know, we've gotten lots of opportunities to see the power of the government unions over the last two years, specifically in the government school system, where the top bosses of the American Federation of Teachers and the NEA have basically had control over the entire school system across the country, going as far as is writing code for the CDC about how to reopen schools. I mean, it's been amazing to see this power. But this power, in as a result of this monopoly power that's granted in the situation like this in New York under the Taylor law there, is something that we hope to make sure that more more people understand. Certainly getting the word out about Janus and government employees' rights across the country not to fund it, not to be forced to pay their money to fund it, but also the second injustice is this forced representation. This idea that the monopoly power of a private organization can step in and say, this is how you're going to work, whether you like it or not. And this is what you're going to accept as our statements about political issues, religious issues in this case. I mean, this is an outrageous usurpation of power above and beyond what individual freedom ought to be in the workplace. And yet union officials and many politicians support it because it creates this vicious cycle, Stephanie, where, you know, Union officials help to elect members of school boards, members of county commissions, members of Congress, members of state legislatures. They provide funding for that. And then they're negotiating with them and on the other side of the table. And that happens all across the country. And so we want people to understand that union officials have been granted this unique monopoly power. And this is how it manifests itself in the workplace. And just to follow up real quickly, do all the plaintiffs in this lawsuit, do they all still work at CUNY? Uh, yeah, all six of them do work there in various capacities. And, you know, basically they're all into one big bargaining unit. The adjunct professors are with the senior professors and they negotiate terms for all of them. And we know that, you know, just this negotiation in order, you can't make everybody equal in the workplace. And, and that kind of violates other rights too, but that's a bigger issue. But this notion that this organization can threaten and continue to, to encourage people to threaten students and other people to threaten members that they claim to represent is really an outrage in federal and state labor law. And lastly, where can people go to learn more about this case? Yeah, Stephanie, they can find information about the case at our website, or the foundation's website at nrtw.org, nrtw.org. And again, President of the National Right to Work Foundation, Mark Mix, thank you so much again for your time. Stephanie, thank you for bringing this important issue to folks' attention. Thank you.